Hello there, scientists. Today is Thursday, February 4th. We are going to be talking about actual biotech biotechnology today. Now that we have kind of uh, reviewed DNA, genes, chromosomes, and how they all work in our in living organisms um, and wrapped our head around that, we're gonna actually start diving into the exciting field of biotechnology and how it affects us on our on our daily lives, in our daily lives. So if you turn your learned notebook to page 11, we're gonna go ahead and complete the guided notes first. And then we're going to talk about the chart at the bottom of page 11. So biotechnology is the application of technology involving living organisms to achieve a beneficial purpose. It involves genetics and living organisms. Simply stated, DNA is manipulated or new DNA is made from piecing together small fragments from other sources. This is called recombinant DNA. Any DNA that has been broken apart or shuffled, think of it as recombined. You can almost see the word recombined in recombinant. Biotechnology involves recombinant DNA, manipulating DNA in some way, transferring DNA from one organism to another. So vectors, we talked about vectors when we studied health and disease in our last unit. And we talked about the rats that were vectors during the Great Plague. They helped to transport the fleas around, which were uh, able to transmit the plague. Um, vectors are mechanisms used to transfer DNA. It moves DNA in this con context, it moves the DNA into a new cell. So think of the visual of a, almost a gene gun shooting DNA into a new location. Biological vectors are living. They also may be used to transfer DNA. So we're gonna to talk today about the fields of, the main fields of biotechnology at the bottom of page 11, which are healthcare, forensic science, agriculture, and ecology. I'm gonna switch slides here. And I am going to go to my slideshow and we're going to look at those, those fields together. So again, we have healthcare very much in the news nowadays with the uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination, especially. That is where scientists were able to take pieces of RNA from the virus. Remember the virus is non-living. Um, they took pieces of it put it into the vaccine, which is injected into humans, the humans uh, develop an immune response to that RNA being in their body and develop antibodies so that if a person does contract the virus, they are more likely to have a uh, less severe form of symptoms and all, or possibly be immune altogether. Um, we're gonna talk about some many examples of healthcare today. Forensic science is the science of crime scene investigations using uh, DNA evidence um, to support um, crime situations. Uh, agriculture is farming and of crops uh, and also of livestock. And then ecology is biotechnology in our environment. And again, there are so many different examples of each of these. Today, we're just going to talk about a few. As you're thinking about these different fields and also the um, examples in each field, I want you to think not only of the benefits, but also the risks and the drawbacks, because every single situation where there is something that is benefiting um, humanity, there are also risks or drawbacks. Think of it as pros and cons. So let's talk about healthcare. Um, in class today, one of the examples we talked about was obviously the coronavirus vaccine. Um, another example, I've got several today to share with you, could be infertility treatments. This was um, an early example of biotechnology taking place in the 1970s. Um, before the 1970s, if a couple wanted to have a biological child of their own and they were suffering from infertility, there wasn't a lot of options available to them. Um, nowadays, we have what we call IVF, in vitro fertilization. Um, if you use a search engine look, look up uh, test tube baby, you will see the story of Louise. She was the first baby born um, using this method of in vitro fertilization in England in the late 1970s. Basically, it, it's, I'll simplify the process. Um, doctors extract 
egg cells from a mother and are, they take sperm cells from the father and combine them in a laboratory setting. So kind of in a Petri dish, um, they, um, they are implanted and um, you have embryos that are you know, the result of this. The embryos can then be implanted into the uterus of the mother and hopefully they take hold. If all goes well, they take hold and the mother um, is able to give birth to a child, a biological child of her own. Oftentimes doctors don't just do one or two embryos. They take, they harvest several eggs, lots of eggs and sperms and create several embryos, um, sometimes up to even a dozen. They freeze the ones that are not being used in case the couple decides to have a child in the future. Um, so just some, when we talk about ethics, we'll be talking about this, but also something to think about. Um, first of all, the, the drawbacks, the procedure is, is somewhat painful for the mother to have the eggs extracted surgically. And also those frozen embryos, what happens to the embryos that are not used? Um, in class, we discussed the possibility of them being donated to another couple that possibly didn't even have eggs or sperm cells. Um, also, we talked about the you know, the ethical implications of keeping them frozen for eternity uh, or also uh, destroying the embryos. So, you know, it gets into ethics. We have differing opinions about when does life begin. Um, if you believe that life begins at conception, you're going to believe one way. If you believe that life begins um, at birth, you're going to have another thought process. So it's just something to think about. There are no right or wrong answers. This is something um, to think about and also discuss with your, with your parents. Another situation where biotechnology is definitely um, a positive, it's very helpful, um, is with breast cancer being such a prevalent cancer in our world. Um, it takes the lives of so many women every year. Um, so they have been able to isolate the, what they call the BRCA2 gene, the BRCA2 gene. Um, that gene tends to mutate and has been found to cause cancer. Um, a prime example would be Kaylee McEnany, who was our previous uh, White House press secretary. You might've seen her in the news. Um, she had this um, test done, this, I believe it's a blood test in her um, early 20s and was told that yes, she tested positive for this genetic mutation. And she was told by her doctors that she had an 84% chance of developing breast cancer at some point in her life. So she made the difficult decision to have what they call prophylactic surgery. Um, she had a double mastectomy, which all but eliminated every chance of her ever developing breast cancer um, in her lifetime. So again, it's a, an area where it's very helpful. Drawbacks are that is a, you know, it's a very invasive surgery. Um, reconstruction has to occur in the breast area. And, um, but again, you have to decide, do the risks outweigh or do they outweigh the benefits or do the benefits outweigh the risks? So let's look at forensic science now. Forensics um, using DNA evidence at a crime scene. Um, you know, scientists are able now to examine something, something as simple as a piece of hair or a hair follicle um, to identify or exonerate uh, criminals. So let me give you a little example. Let's say you have a crime scene where there is someone has been stabbed to death and they're lying in the middle of their living room floor. Um, this caused lots of lively discussions today in our classes, but um, let's say a neighbor sees a woman hysterically running out of the house, you know, right about the time that they think the crime was committed. So they, they go and investigate and they find a hair on the body of the victim that doesn't belong to that victim. It's a somebody else's hair. They end up tracking down the lady that was running, you know, hysterically from the house, and the hair is a perfect match to her hair. Now you might think, ah, oh, we have found the perpetrator, the murderer. So because you know, DNA evidence is very compelling, right? It proves that the woman running from the house was at the crime scene, but does it prove that she committed the murder? So think about that just for a minute. We know the pros, uh, DNA evidence in crime scene um, has been 
touted as being the greatest forensic advancement since the advent of fingerprinting. Um, it can be stored for years. This evidence can be stored and, and logged and used it to solve cold cases. It is considered to be more reliable than eyewitnesses. Some drawbacks, are you comfortable with the government having a database of our DNA? That brings up some privacy concerns. Um, sometimes improperly trained technicians can cause sloppy work, right? You want to make sure that the DNA evidence that is being presented is true and accurate. And then what if a criminal actually planted some DNA from others to frame them? So that's just another um, possibility. Well, let's go back to our scenario right now where we have the, the woman. What if I told you that the woman running hysterically from the house was the housemaid and she had been upstairs cleaning. She heard a terrible noise, you know, came down, saw the body on the floor in the living room with all of the blood. She leaned over to see if she could help the person. Obviously she couldn't. And one of her hairs very gently just fell from her head onto the body. Well, what if they use that evidence to convict her? What if she serves 30 years or worse gets the death penalty for a crime she didn't commit? So again, like I said, these are just things for you to think about. Um, there is no right or wrong answer. There is definitely uh, many sides to these um, discoveries and these advancements in um, biotech. And it's just worth being aware um, being knowledgeable of, and looking at things from all the different perspectives. So that's just one example of, of biotech and forensics. Let's now move on to agriculture. Agriculture, agriculture is, in case you're not aware, it is the practice of farming, food, um, and also includes livestock. So things like you know cows and chickens, uh, corn, wheat, all of those are considered agriculture. So it's, it's the, the science of producing food. So we know that genetically modifying uh, crops or livestock has a lot of benefits, right? It helps to basically scientists go in, they manipulate the DNA in a plant or uh, in an, even in an animal. And this can increase yields. So how much corn or wheat um, or chicken is being produced. So it increases the numbers. And it also helps to make crops uh, less, uh, they're more disease resistant and resistant to pests so that farmers don't have to use as many herbicides and pesticides on their crops. So that's a benefit, right? We don't want to ingest herbicides or pesticides. Um, but let's look at some of the negatives. Um, there have not been a lot of long-term studies about ingesting um, GMO uh, foods. We don't know if it can harm us or if it's completely safe. We are without a doubt eating genetically modified foods. Um, there's just no way around it um, in, our, in our modern world. Uh, some of the things to think about, it's possibly introducing new allergens. Um, it is actually shown to increase uh, bacteria, the resistance to antibiotics and bacteria. Um, so let's look at chickens. Let's talk about chickens as an example. Um, chickens, this was an average looking chicken in the year 1957. I grew up on a chicken farm. I uh, remember my aunt and uncle with their chicken houses. This is the way the chickens looked, right? Just kind of running around. I've raised chickens as an adult as well for eggs. And I know that, um, you know, they're kind of skinny. They look like kind of large birds. Um, 1978, they're getting a little bigger, a little fatter. They've probably started to introduce um, antibiotics into their feed. They're developing, you know, feeds and things that can, um, you know, make the chicken grow faster. Uh, growth hormones are another thing. They're putting um, hormones into the feed of um, chickens and also in, they're injecting it into cows for milk production, to increase milk production, that's called the bovine growth hormone. Um, but if you look at the year 2005, which was 16 years ago, look at this chicken. This chicken has, has been genetically modified. He looks like a gigantic chicken, same breed and everything. Look at this guy and then look at this guy. Um, these chickens are being bred for their meaty parts to be larger. Um, so for example, the breast meat, which is you know highly sought after, the thigh meat, 
Um, these are the things that people want to eat. So they're selectively uh, choosing those genes and implanting them to make these chickens um, so large that um, they're finding that they can't even walk. So this chicken is alive. Um, as you can see, the breast tissue is so large on this chicken, it's not even able to grow feathers. Um, this guy is having a hard time walking. It appears that he's having a hard time um, even standing up to go to the bathroom. So I, I'm gonna guess that this chicken probably has never seen the light of day. And they're, they're able to grow a chicken from an egg to send it to uh, the processing plant in about five weeks. So he's not even living a very long life or she's not very living a very long life. So these are ethical things. Is it, is it okay for us to have um, you know, breast meat to consume at the expense of the chicken, you know, the chicken's comfort level. These are thinking animals. I mean, these animals are, you know, they're fairly intelligent. I mean, they can't do algebra, but they can certainly um, sense pain and discomfort. Um, so it's just something to think about. Um, and what are the implications for humans ingesting this breast meat that has been uh, pumped up with antibiotics, growth hormones, and then the genes of the chicken have been modified. So again, it gives you a lot to think about. All right, let's move on to ecology. And I have kind of an old fashioned, uh, if there is such a thing, biotechnology um, situation to run past you. Uh, ecology is again, our environment and our planet. So there are many, many things going on today in the year 2021 with biotech and the environment, um, such as introducing organisms to um, clean up abiotic um, things such as an oil spill. But today we're gonna to talk about the introduction of kudzu to the United States. So um, kudzu was introduced into this country, oh, decades ago to help decrease the amount of erosion and runoff on land. So for open areas where there was, for example, in North Carolina, we have red clay soil, they planted kudzu. They brought it over from Asian countries and transplanted it here. Well, what they didn't think about was that the kudzu was going to completely take over. And, you know, we're fortunate in Burlington, we don't have a lot of kudzu, um, but it's on its way. Uh, if you go to Hillsborough, Raleigh, or Durham, you will see a lot of kudzu. And kudzu basically is a vine that is what we call a non-native. It's not from here and it's invasive. It's an invasive species. So once it takes hold, it takes over. This you can see, this is a, an image. Um, taken where the, it is choking out everything in its path. This used to be a tree. Now it's just a place for the kudzu to grow. Same thing with these smaller trees, bushes, shrubs, uh, blackberry bushes, nothing can grow because the kudzu will take over, choke out anything else in its path. So was that a good solution? We used something um, biotechnology. We used something living to solve a problem uh, again, it's kind of old fashioned because we just planted it. We didn't do anything with the genes or anything of that nature, but um, there were definitely implications. So what I want you guys to do is I train you to be thinkers, not followers. I want you to be thinkers. I want you to think about for every positive thing that we develop, what are the implications? What are the drawbacks? What are the um, possibilities for harm too? Because that's important to take note of those things. So. Um, you've got a chart at the bottom of page 11, and I want you to think of your own examples in the fields of healthcare, forensic science, agriculture, and ecology. I want you to do some research and go to a search engine and type in, type in biotechnology and healthcare, biotechnology and forensic science, biotechnology and agriculture and in ecology. And I want you to find some examples, and I want you to not only put down the benefits, but also the risks or the drawbacks that are involved in each so that we can continue this discussion, especially if we move in as we move into ethics in biotechnology. So I appreciate your listening today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. We will be going over the biotechnology tools together in class on Monday um, on page 12, but go ahead and finish that chart on page 11. Have a great day and I will see you next time.